Stanford University. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, speaking with you about expanding the frontiers of computer science education to talk about some things we've done in the department, both at Stanford and how some of those things have translated into the rest of the world with regard to education and computer science. So I'll just start with one little quote I'd like to share with a lot of our current students, which is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Many of you are probably already familiar with this from Arthur C. Clarke. And it's an interesting thing for the current generation of students who grew up with wizards and witches and Harry Potter, right, that they like to think of, wouldn't it be great if there was a place where you could actually learn to do magic? And one of the things we try to inspire in them is that you can do that. You can do that here through technology, because that's what really creates sort of what we think of as the next level of magic in the world. But despite the fact that there's lots of excitement around computer science and the fact that there's also lots of excitement about what you can do with it, it wasn't always the case. So let me give you a little historical perspective. Here's what I think of as the most famous chart in computer science education. And it's a little chart that comes from the Talby survey. This is actually hot off the press about 10 days ago, which shows the number of students declaring computer science or computer engineering as a major nationally. Okay, so this is across the whole country. And if you look at that graph, what you see is back in 2000, we were partying like it was 1999, right? <laughs> Partly because it's pretty close to 1999. But what happened from that point, if you look at the number of people declaring computer science, in the next five years, that number dropped in half nationally. Okay? So that by 2007, there were not that many students. There was half as many students majoring in computer science. I didn't actually draw the scale for the graph. So you have to sort of work with the numbers. The scale doesn't go to zero at the bottom. And we've recently been seeing some growth again. Okay? But it's not near where it was back in 2000, 2001, 2002. Now these are the numbers nationally, right? So when we look at this, there's sometimes a tendency, especially in this area, to say, well, we're in the heart of Silicon Valley. There's all this innovation going on. There's Stanford University. Things must be different here, right? So let me show you some data from Stanford. So here's a 15-year period from 1993, close, but not all the way back to the founding of the undergraduate program in the department, 2007. And you see exactly the same effect. We were not at all immune from the national trend. The number of students declaring computer science each year peaks in 2001, then drops by 50% over the next six years. Right? There's certainly exciting things going on in the field of computing. And the real question is, why did this happen? Right? And if you think about this, if you look at this graph for a while, it's not a big surprise because there's another graph that people are more familiar with that looks a little bit like this. Here's the NASDAQ composite index, <laughs> averaged on an annual basis over the same period of time. And what you can see is that there's a peak, it drops pretty precipitously, and over time it starts making a comeback. And so it doesn't take a lot of insight to say, hey, let's do a little bit of analytics by putting these two graphs on top of each other. Okay? Now, before I do that, though, the one thing we need to understand is that students are not exactly a marketplace in the same sense that the stock market's a marketplace, right? It's not like stocks go up today, I'm going to major in computer science. Tomorrow, stocks and technology go down, I'm majoring in English. Oh, they went back up, back to computer science, right? It takes some time for these kind of macro changes in the economy to impact students' decision making. So what I did is say, let's say that period of time is about nine months, because then that conveniently aligns the calendar year with the academic year. So I took the data on students declaring computer science, and the student on NASDAQ shifted the declarations by nine months to make up for the fact that that was the time that students would take to internalize this kind of information in their decision making. And then you put the two graphs on top of each other. And what you see is a very clear trend, that they both peak in the same place, they're both highly correlated. And so then this interesting question comes up, though. I mean, we actually have a correlation. If you look at just the 1993 to 2003 numbers, that correlation is almost 90%. Right? Anytime anyone gives you a 90% correlation, you should think they've been doctoring the numbers. Thankfully, you can verify these numbers. I didn't doctor them. But something happens in 2003. Right? The numbers begin to diverge. So we see the economy recovering, but the number of students majoring in computer science is still going down. And the question is why? 
So that's where we dig a little bit deeper because it's not so obvious. The economic correlation is a little bit more obvious, but what happened in 2003? So you think back a little bit, and this is around the time that all the sensationalist news starts coming out about job offshoring. Right? So the idea is that students may see the economy recovering. For example, the high-tech economy is indicated by the NASDAQ but they don't believe that that necessarily translates into jobs for them because the jobs are all being shipped overseas to China or India. At least that's the perception. And so the question is, is that really true, right? This is what's being played up in the press. What can we understand about what the numbers are? And so there's really nothing more exciting on a morning than seeing statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So let me give you some statistics, okay? What the Bureau of Labor Statistics likes to do, because they obviously like statistics that's in their name, is they keep track of the number of students who graduate with bachelor's degrees in various fields versus the job demand in those fields. So here's what it looks like in mathematics and physical sciences. Okay? The number of jobs is actually slightly less than the number of graduates. And it's actually not surprising. So if you think about mathematics and you think about how many people do mathematics on a daily basis, that's their job. This is a tough crowd to ask that question in because there's probably a lot of people who are like, yeah, I do math on a daily basis. In the population in general, there aren't really that many. So what happens? That field gets to cream skim. Right? The mathematicians, there's a large number of them who get their degrees in mathematics. Some number of them will go and do mathematics on a daily basis, and some number of them will find jobs in other fields. So what does this look like in computing? Here are the numbers in computing. Okay? So the production of graduates in computer science is roughly one-third the number of jobs at least as predicted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So guess what happens to those mathematicians and those physicists? And I could ask you this question. How many of you work at companies that hire students who've had undergraduate degrees in math and physics because you don't have enough people whose undergraduate degrees are in computer science? Right? A fair number. And that's what's happening, right? So it's not that I necessarily cry for the mathematicians or the physicists. They're fine. They're super smart people, and they end up filling part of that yellow bar. But that yellow bar is nowhere near being filled with people who have a background in computing or even in technical disciplines. And so we see that as one of the challenges of how do we actually get more students to think about computing as a potential program that they're interested in, whether or not they necessarily want to major in it or they want to use computing as a substrate to apply to other areas. And we'll talk about that as well. So what does this translate into? What it translates into at the college level is we need to create greater awareness of what students can do with computing. We need to think about the notion of CS in the large. The computing is not just about someone sitting in a cube 80 hours a week in programming, but is really about building artifacts, understanding how people use them, and having a larger impact in a variety of contexts. And it's those contexts that become important in the sense that computing is increasingly needed for work in other fields. I certainly don't need to tell this crowd this. But what we need to get students to understand is that programming is not the end in itself. Programming is the means to achieve some end, right? Your average student doesn't say, oh, I don't care if I build, you know, missile guidance systems or apps on my iPhone. I just like to program, right? What they really care about is what is the net result of my programming actually going to achieve in the world? And that's the notion of empowerment. How do we empower students to think about what they can do with an education in computing to be able to have bigger impacts across a variety of fields? And so to do that, what we ended up doing was thinking about what our curriculum looked like. So if we think about the footprints of computer science, I took a lot of the subdisciplines of computer science, I projected them down into two dimensions, which basically means that it would create an argument with anyone in this room, probably myself included, depending on which day I made this projection. But let's just pretend that we could think about some of these subfields laid out. So what traditionally we gave students, if you remember back to sort of, you know, maybe the mid-90s in terms of the education that we provided, was there was some combination of systems and programming, some amount of theory and mathematics, and some amount of AI, because Stanford has a long and strong history in AI, that we would provide students at the undergraduate level. And in the past 20 or 30 years, what happened? There were a bunch of other fields that developed into full, mature, blossoming fields that weren't just areas of research anymore. They were really areas that involved education pretty significantly. But our students weren't getting much exposure to that at the undergraduate level. They might be able to take an elective class here or there, but they couldn't really go deep. 
And so what we wanted to do was redesign the major a few years back, where rather than sort of thinking of that yellow circle in the middle, what we did was we had a different kind of structure that at the undergraduate level allowed students to really go deep in these new areas of computing and see the bridges to other fields. So things like natural language processing or computational biology. But the challenge in doing this is that the material that gets covered at the undergraduate level has to remain in terms of the same volume. It has to remain the same. The actual content doesn't remain the same, but how many classes, how many units we require, that can't change. We can't suddenly make computer science a six-year degree. But if we give students an option, if we can redesign the program in a way so that we streamline the core that everyone sees, but then allow students to pick their concentration in a wide variety of areas, then instead of the small circle becoming computing, it's the big circle that's now available through computer science. And if you've ever used PowerPoint, you know just how complicated it is to make that slide, so I'm going to force you to watch it again. <laughs> There it is. The, we won't even talk about it. <laughs> but now that we make the big picture available, right, we have this diverse set of areas. We cast a wider net for computer science majors. And when you can cast a really wide net, something else happens. The students more directly see in this big tent of computer science, which is with the themes that we have, where other fields come in and where computing impacts those other fields and where those other fields impact computing. And in order to actually build those bridges, not in just a cursory way where we tell students, you know what, there's connections between economics and computer science. There's connections between art and computer science. We need to make those connections meaningful in a way that they actually have to become part of the curriculum. So someone who's doing work, for example, in graphics can appreciate art by taking classes in the art department and count that toward a computer science major. And so in developing these, this track structure, which is what we allow students to do, we came up with an initial list of track areas. Some of them are sort of bread and butter that you'll recognize offhand, artificial intelligence, theory, and systems. There's computer engineering, which is more of a hardware-oriented track. But we also look at areas that have really emerged to be large areas in the last 20 years, human-computer interaction and graphics, biocomputation, which actually includes in it many pre-med requirements. So in terms of biocomputation, one of the debates we had in the department, which wasn't really much of a debate because everyone was in agreement, is who are going to be the leaders in biocomputation? Are they going to be people who just understand algorithms and how to apply algorithms to biology? Or are they people who understand the algorithms and understand the biology? And so we actually made hard choices to say, if you want to do biocomputation as a computer science major, you still take a year of biology and you take a year of chemistry, which means you actually have many pre-med requirements as part of that program. And interestingly enough, we actually have students now who are pre-med majoring in computer science instead of biology, because they'll still get their requirements done and they'll go to medical school afterward and they will be the leaders in computational biology after they graduate. And that's really what our goal is in education, is to be helping to foster leaders in the field. Thank you. What that also means, though, is that we need to really think about interdisciplinary options and be real about it. So one of the things that comes up, for example, is we included courses from many other departments at Stanford, because Stanford isn't just a technical institute, right? It's not an institute of technology. It's a university that brings a rich diversity to what our students can learn through computing. And part of that means bringing that richness directly into the major. So for example, a student doing graphics. One of the classes they can take that counts toward the graphics program, sure, they're going to take a lot of classes in mathematics, and they're really going to, they're going to do all the matrix multiplications and other things they need to know. They'll ray trace. But they can also take a class in studio art. And so the question comes up, studio art, why would you count that toward a graphics program? And it was actually the graphics faculty that made the most compelling argument for this, which basically boils down, I'm going to paraphrase their term, to if you take a crappy picture and render it at high resolution, what do you have? You have a high resolution crappy picture. If you need to understand what makes a good picture, you need to understand what art is about. And so that's part of where we, those interdisciplinary ties come in to make someone a stronger graphics student because they understand not only the technology but the art that also goes into it. And this permeates many different areas. For example, in human-computer interaction, the notions of design and need finding are classes that are part of that, the bread and butter of 
that major or that track within the computer science major, the students are still getting algorithms, they're still getting theory, they're still getting all the robust programming that you'd want them to have in software engineering, but now they're seeing the ways that this ties and impacts other fields and vice versa. So what happened? Right, I showed you this graph before, which was, here was the number of computer science majors from 1993 to 2007 or 2008. I even showed you the national numbers, which went all the way out to 2013, right, which showed that the numbers nationally had recovered about halfway from this dip. Well, here's what happened at Stanford. In 2008, 2009, the new curriculum went into effect because we sort of believe in that fast-moving culture. We just put everything together in one year. So it was, we flipped the switch, and here was the new curriculum. And this was the result. So the number of CS majors, remember we had that three to one gap in the number of jobs that were rejected versus the number of graduates that were being produced. The number of CS, the number of students declaring CS as their major this past year is 350% of what it was six years ago. This year we're on par to even break that record. And computer science for the last two years now has been the largest undergraduate major at Stanford. So it's, thank you. And it's the first time any engineering major at Stanford has actually had that designation. Now, while I really like these numbers, I think there's another way of looking at the numbers that makes me even more happy, which is take those numbers and break them down in terms of the number of men versus women majoring in computer science. So one of the things, if we look at this most recent year, we have, as Alex referred to this morning, 28% of students declaring computer science last year were female. That's much above the national average for research universities. But I think a way to put this into a more startling context is if you think about just the number of women majoring in computer science last year, that's more than all the computer science majors at Stanford six years ago. And so what that means is what we're trying to do is be able to turn a corner to not only have a higher percentage of women in the field, but to create more of a critical mass in a community that over time we can just continue to see that percentage accelerate toward 50%. And if we think about what that pipeline looks like, right, this is at the level of when students actually declare their major. Where do they come into the major? What does that pipeline actually look like? That's our introductory programming class. Hopefully you have a warm place in your heart for CS106A, whether or not you took it or TA'd it or whatever the case may be. Here's what the enrollment in that class looks like over the past few years. This current year, which we can actually get the numbers on because spring quarter's already started, we have 1,600 students taking CS106A. To put that into context, the size of a freshman class at Stanford is roughly 1,700 students. Okay. That's not to say that these are all undergrads, some of them are graduate students, but it is to say that it, without it being a university requirement, the vast majority of all undergraduates at Stanford now take a computer science class, and not just a computer science class to get a requirement out of the way, but the actual programming class that potentially leads them further on into the major if they want to go. And that class is now over 45% women. So we're almost there. We're almost to 50-50. We haven't gotten there yet, but this is the beginning of the pipeline. And so I'm excited to see in the coming years what happens further in terms of creating greater gender balance. Let me show you one more graph. I know this crowd is probably a crowd that likes numbers. So this is the total number of units that the computer science department teaches over time. And as you can see in the last six years, that's gone through the roof. It's actually doubled in six years. The size of our department has not doubled in six years. We're pretty busy these days, as Alex alluded to. But really, the exciting thing about it is that the CS department teaches more units than any other department at Stanford. And what that really means is whether or not students major in computer science, we can show them the power of computing and the impact that it can have in whatever they are studying. And that's one of the things that's very exciting to us is that we really see computer science education as that substrate that's going to impact other fields whether or not someone's doing computer science or not. So let me push a little further on that. You know, this is great that we can make some of these impacts at Stanford, but how can we push this even further? How can we take this notion and go global with it? And so it turns out every decade the major computing professional societies, the ACM and the IEEE Computing Society, sponsor a set of curricular volumes for undergraduate degrees in computer science. The idea is to create a curricular volume that provides guidance worldwide for what undergraduate programs in computer science should look like. And it's internationally recognized. 
The latest volume was actually just released in December of 2013. It's called CS 2013, Computer Science 2013 for short. And the big tense of computer science, that theme I talked about, actually permeates the volume. As a matter of fact, the Stanford curriculum shows up explicitly in that volume as an exemplar curriculum in terms of building computer science programs. So what's this done? Well, it's influencing curriculum development around the world. There's already numerous universities in both the United States and Europe that have adopted these curricular guidelines, some of which within that one year time have actually completely revamped their curriculum to be in line with these guidelines. China is in the process of translating the guidelines and sending it to every university in China through an effort from the Ministry of Education in China. There was just a conference in India this past week with members of academia, uh, industry and government there in terms of how they can take these guidelines to help increase Indian computer science education across the board because as Daphne alluded to last night there are serious problems with quality of education and so one of the things they look at is what can we use as an internationally recognized standard for doing that. South Korea has had summits on this, many other countries are in the process of doing it and inside that document you see classes like CS106A show up because the Stanford curriculum's whole hog in there. So at Stanford, we're trying to push these notions even further of when we think about computer science impacting other areas. And so there has been a CS plus X joint major program, which Eric Roberts, one of the faculty in our department, proposed and has since come to life this past year. And the idea is to encourage students to do multidisciplinary work in computer science and some other discipline. That's where the X comes from. These days, it's pretty popular to have X be a variable that you fill in. And so X was, or the CS plus X program was launched this academic year, so it's just starting to ramp up. And the initial choices of X were consciously made to be programs in the humanities as a way of showing that it's not just computer science potentially having an impact on another very related discipline, like say mathematics, but the computer science can have impacts in other fields that people would think were far afield from them, like English or philosophy and at the same time encourage students coming to Stanford to think of this institution as not just a technical institution, but as a university where they can explore multiple interests and be able to put them together in a program that actually in the capstone shows an integration between what students are doing in the humanities and what they're doing in computer science. And so you can think of examples of the kind of things that would go on here, where students could use, for example, programs or, or uh, methods from natural language processing to be able to analyze history historical text to look at how they changed over time or the kind of influences that actually occurred in someone's writing. And these are the kinds of things our students are now doing at the undergraduate level because they've been enabled to do that. So what it really comes down to at the end is the two big themes I think our department has for education, which is to provide a world-class computer science education for the students here at Stanford and to take that to in turn create leadership for computer science education on a global level. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, so we have mics around the room if uh, people have a couple questions for Mehran. So everything you've said is great, but I'd propose that there's another piece of the puzzle about what makes people choose a career, which is that there are exciting ideas in that field. And I've realized lately that at the high school level, people don't learn what are the exciting ideas, what are the grand ideas of computer science. They think of computer science as programming. So I would propose that we should all be thinking about ways to change the high school curriculum so people actually learn what some of those grand exciting ideas in computer science are. I think that's a great point. And I'll oh, feel free. Sorry, I didn't want to cut off the applause. Um, that's a great point. As a matter of fact, there's multiple efforts that are going on in that vein. Um, there are outreach programs that we actually do at Stanford, but there's other programs that have come into being that are supported by a large number of uh, folks who really have a vested interest in seeing computing as something that's accessible to a wider variety of people. So for example, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, kind of many of the large companies have programs in this vein to affect computing education, not just in colleges, but at the K through 12 level. And most recently, there's a uh, organization called code.org, which is a nonprofit, which has really been pushing a curriculum nationwide. Um, and they have a new curriculum at both the K through five level and for high school level. And several people in our department are actually closely involved in advisory roles and other kinds of roles 
worldswithcode.org. So completely agree with you. Didn't have time to talk about it. So thanks for asking. It seems like a it seems like a really big leap for somebody that has domain excitement to move over to computer science and do a CS plus X. Why not also offer an X plus CS option which keeps them in their domain but adds some CS quality to it? So that's a good point. The CS plus X, even though the CS, the CS really comes first because it was created in the CS department, but it really is equal partners in the endeavor. So the way the program is structured is that the students go just as deep in the X area as they do in computing in terms of what the requirements are for the respective programs. So it's not that CS plus X says you do all of computer science and you just take a couple classes somewhere else. You really are almost doing a double major, but the idea behind CS CS plus X was to basically cut off the sharp corners to make it easier for someone to do. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.